Hello, everyone. In the context of IMES 20th anniversary, the IMES book presentation series aims to display and provide a window for the diversified research publications existing in the IMES community, spanning a variety of subjects and novelties, theoretical and empirical frameings, local and global contexts, as well as junior and senior authors. With a view to gathering prominent and promising researchers in the field, working on this wide range of topics, there will be a monthly session and all of, all, all of them are available on the IMES YouTube channel, so you can use them for your own research and teaching purposes. In addition to the above, please remind participants when introducing the session that is being, re oh, okay, so that's for me. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, welcome everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen. Cool. For us, it's a, an honor actually to be part of this 20th anniversary of Emes Network. Today, um, I have a pleasure to share with all of you a book that we could write a few years ago with a group of academics slash professionals in the area of social innovation, social entrepreneurship, um, about the social innovation in Latin America, okay? So the title of the book is Social Innovation in Latin America, Maintaining and Restoring Social and Natural Capital. So thanks for that to Imes. Um, I have a pleasure to introduce you with um, the participants that today they're gonna speak about their chapters. Um, first of all, we have myself. I wrote a chapter about when we and development. Then we have Louisa Ashley. She's gonna talk about her chapter in governance um, and other topics. Then we have from Peru, Jose Carlos Oldevilla. He's gonna talk about the chapter that he wrote about Peru. And uh, we're gonna end it up with Carol Hill Vasquez. She's gonna talk about a Mexican case about the same topic, okay? Cool. So I wanna talk very quickly how this book emerged, okay? A few years ago, uh, we basically organized an event in Colombia, okay? The aim of this um, basically event was to gather researchers from Peru, Mexico, um, United Kingdom, Colombia and Ecuador. Okay, so we spent about five days, almost a week, visiting projects, uh, creating research groups, learning about the environment, learning about theories and concepts, and an idea just came up. So all of us, or some of us, we gathered and we said, listen, we need to move forward and do something after that. So we decided to co-author co a book, okay? So what we wanted is to provide um, different chapters from different countries in the Latin American context. And that is why we kind of like make a call for our colleagues to, to write about their context. So we have people from Spain, from the United Kingdom, from Peru, from Mexico, from Ecuador, from Venezuela, from Chile. So what we wanted to basically was to discuss the topic about the Latin American from our colleagues in Latin America, okay? So based upon these kind of conversations, we finally and eventually we published this piece of work, okay? So the, the, the basically the book is divided into two parts. The first part is more conceptual. Uh, it discusses the conceptual frameworks to understand social innovation and natural and social capital in Latin America. And the second part goes to the social innovation and natural capital. And there is a third part that we discuss about social innovation and hu human capital. As you can see in the slides, there are different cases from different authors about their local context. Okay, so we, what we wanted it basically to illustrate what was going on 
by the time in the Latin American context, focusing on these topics, which were relevant and we were discussing in this event, okay? And eventually of this book and of these conversations, we also published, um, and it is available online, a social innovation MOOC. It's freely available for whomever is, uh, is willing to do it. it. It has both aspects. It's also conceptual, but also very practical, right? That's why we wanted to gather different people from different backgrounds, because they are not only academics, but also professionals. But we wanted to have this kind of hybrid perspective about the topic, okay? So they are both, um, they are available in both languages, in English and in Spanish, okay? Having said that, um, we have today Jose and Karen, they're gonna talk later. So we're gonna start from the first part of the book. Uh, we're gonna talk about Buen Vivir, a decolonial approach to the development. So it's gonna be myself who's gonna talk briefly about this chapter. Then Dr. Ashley couldn't make it because she's traveling. So she recorded a little video. So she's gonna talk about her chapter about global governance to address local yields. The Universal Periodic Review, aiding the creation of a third space in pursuit of land rights that support social innovation, biodiversity, and natural capital in Latin America. So if that's okay with you guys, I'm gonna start with my chapter, It'll be very brief. Okay, for this chapter, first of all, I wanna have these kind of like key terms, okay? Of course, Buen Vivir or BV. Then we have three crucial terms, which is one, the indigenous approach, the socially status approach, and the ecologist developmentalist approach, okay? So our chapter uh, was aiming firstly to review succinctly the main development theories in order to position the BV within the, de the development theory, okay? BV emerges as a consequence of the failures of development. So he was trying to build upon the objective to identify alternatives to development rather than development alternative. So they were aiming as a concrete possibility through ecological and cultural transition, right? So the emergence and rationale of the BV is explained, elaborating on BV reasoning by employing the work of Cubillo Guevara et al, Hidalgo and Capitan Cubillo Guevara. Also we have Gudinas, um, uh, we have of course Arturo Escobar. So we kind of built upon this concept of BV based upon different research studies. So, the first, the first two Cubillo, the first two works, Cubillo Guevara et al, and Hidalgo and Capitan and Cubillo Guevara, identified the three traditions that influence, according to them, the present concept of BV. First, the indigenous approach, which I'm gonna, of course, talk about in depth later, the socialist status approach, and the ecologist or developmentalist approach. Okay. So we did a systematic review. I mean, the, the literature review was conducted using a combination of keywords such as Buen Vivir, uh, Worldview or Cosmovision in Spanish, Latin American, Andean region, and, and, and other countries, Ecuador and Bolivia. So where the authors gather information from journal articles, books, and other relevant online material, okay? Out of this in-depth review, um, three values were identified, as you can see in the diagram. Um, there were community, solidarity and reciprocity, and harmony and complementarity, okay? And of course, there were six pillars that they were identified based upon this lead review. There were rights of nature, community well-being, decolonization, 
plurinational state, economic pluralism, and democratization. Okay. Examples of Ecuador and Bolivia were invoked throughout the chapter to try to depict the advancements in the BV implementation back then. No, of course, everything changed. We're talking about a few years' time. So we have to basically allocate ourselves when we wrote the book and the chapter. Okay. So that was very interesting. So first of all, what we did was to basically like go through the classic theories, the emerging theories, and the transition theories, because we were trying to theorize and allocate the BV within the theory of de development, okay? So BV, according to the literature and certain studies, it can be located in the post-development approach, which is mainly coming from the GS. As you can see in the table, right? What I do is divide the paradigms based upon the region. So you have the GN and GS, Global North and Global South, okay? So BV is basically located in the post-development approach, which is basically non-liberal, post-capitalist, non biocentric, of course, and post-extractivist, yeah? So the object of this kind of studies of the paradigm is the construction of other forms of thinking to challenge to challenge, according to them, hegemonic development ideas spreading from the West, okay? So they are trying is to basically separate themselves from the, 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 from the West, okay? You have there some authors. Okay, I'm gonna talk very quickly about this because I know we just have five minutes. So by and large, BV is influenced by the Andean cosmovision or worldview, okay, of indigenous people in Latin America. In fact, BV is the Spanish language translation of Sumac Causay and Suma Cumaña in the Quechua and the Aymara languages, respectively. Both Quechuas and Aymaras are indigenous communities spread out of the whole Andean region. The Quechuas people are mostly allocated in Ecuador, Bolivia, some parts of Peru, Argentina, Chile, and Colombia. Whereas the Aymaras people live in Bolivia, um, some in Peru, Chile, and Argentina too. So we we'll try BVs to echo the Suma Causae, Suma Camaña principles of community, solidarity, and reciprocity. Therefore, the diagram, the diagram that you can see there. So existing literature suggests that BV is considered within the post-development theory, as I said before. Okay. So BV has been identified earlier as an ongoing project to build a different society, sustaining the coexistence of human beings in their diversity and in harmony with oneself, the identity, society in terms of equity, and nature in terms of sustainability, which is based on the recognitions on the perhaps diverse cultural values existing in each country and worldwide. Hence, the concept of BV has been identified in our chapter by these three mentioned before uh, approaches, okay? Firstly, the indigenous approach um, comes from the ancient indigenous, um, it's at the core of the BB, particularly of the Andean indigenous people. This tradition prioritizes indigenous identity and aims for a more Andean indigenous people, right? It, it aims for a more plural and inclusive society in which indigenous people legalize self-determination in their territories and propose in transformation from nation state to plurinational state, when, where indigenous are recognized. So they basically like try their discourses based upon, okay, indigenous rights. The secondly is the socialist slash status approach. Is societal equity is prioritized and is strongly influenced by neo-Marxism. This tradition is laid by the intellectuals involved in the institutionalization of BV, equine indigenous ontologies in the countries of Ecuador and Bolivia. So through this kind of revolutionary concept known as citizen revolution, 
in Ecuador and as a democratic and cultural revolution in Bolivia, these intellectuals propose to implement a new development model that essentially seeks to improve uh, equ uh, equity, okay? So it's more like this kind of mess state approach to the BV. And then we have the third dimension, which is the ecologist or developmentalist approach, which is based upon development theory and praxis. And they are basically um, biocentric, which is the final objective. So this BV tradition relates to the ecological and post-development thinking of intellect intellectuals linked to the critique of development and Latin American social movements. So this approach tends to attach great importance to the role that civil society must play within the society in order to protect the environment, okay? So let's say that we were trying to disentangle based upon the work of these two papers that I mentioned before, what BV is coming from, okay? So here you go, we have identified this as a diagram or as a conceptual framework to understand BV based upon what happened in the countries of Bolivia and Ecuador, okay? So we were talking about these values, community, solidarity and reciprocity and har harmony and complementarity. So why, you know, it's very interesting because community comes, comes from Aiju, which is an essential aspect for indigenous people in the Andes, okay? Whereas solid solidarity and reciprocity comes from Yanapai, solidarity and reciprocity Aini. So you can say how they were translating these values into this modus operandi of BV in their countries. Oh, they were trying to do that, okay? Then when we transcend from the theory to the practice, because BV was institutionalized in this country, um, there were six pillars that were identified, okay? So rise of nature, of course, one of the innovations of BV is the advocacy to establish nature as a living entity to be protected and equally treated. So most notably in the case of Ecuador and Bolivia, the rights of nature have been con constitutionalized in the constitution of 2008 and 2009. So they kind of give rights to nature, okay? Community well-being, which is one of the BV pillar pillars, essentially suggests building up a new society based on different notions of living standards. Hence, moving away from the ones suggested by modernity that are, that are strongly subjected to the economic growth. So more influenced by the summa causa summa kamani approach in which nature is respected and sustainably treated, okay? So they conceive, or they were trying to conceive nature as a whole, okay? Another pillar that was essentially very important, it was the decolonization. Although an, uh, at an early stage, decolonization has become a key component for the conceptualization of BB. In a more radical way, the lead review claims that only by detachment from the Western modes of production and worldview, indigenous people, Afro-descendants, women and nature will be recognized and will dismantle hegemonic social structures. Okay, That's why that was very important, at least in their discourse. And then we have the plurinational state, which is a key concept of the BV project when it was institutionalized, because basically um, was trying to include you know, indigenous and different ethnic minorities into the project. So it has to be more plural, inclusive, and in a way to see society more participatory and participate more actively in the non-hegemonic system, right? So a plurinational state is formulated in the BV literature as such a political mechanism operated by a decentralized political and administrative system that must be culturally heterogeneous and allows the participation of all the social sectors and groups within society. Also, we have economic pluralism. So that was a bit challenging where when they were trying to put this into practice. So the economy is one of the main areas that BV project is challenging because it was attempting to modify 
its perspective. So they were trying to basically um, integrate into the economic approach practices, especially indigenous practices, into the GDP, like uh, voluntary work, uh, bartering, and so on and so forth. Okay, and then democratization. So BV advocators claim that there is no other way to create another development paradigm unless democratic processes are revised and participation made accessible to everyone, not for few bureaucrats. So this pillar is essentially constructed by the objective of dismantling representative democracy and take forward practices of, communi of communal democracy. So with this, um, I'm gonna end it up there because I don't wanna spend more time. So we're gonna go and I'm gonna share with you um, the work of uh, Dr. Ashley, Dr. Luisa Ashley. So two seconds. Yeah. Perfect. It'll be also five minutes. Hello, I'm Dr. Louisa Ashley of Leeds Law School, part of Leeds Beckett University in the UK. We it's cannot a pleasure her. to be part of this anniversary event celebrating the important work of social enterprise and the publication of the Social Innovation in Latin America edited collection. A special thank you to the hosts for inviting me and allowing me to join you in this way. And my apologies that I'm not able to be with you live in person, as it were. Andres, we cannot see her. her. Can, you, can you start again? Sorry. You cannot see it? No, we just hear okay, her, but wait. we cannot see her. Two seconds. I think it's better to go again now. Yep. Thank you to the hosts for inviting me and allowing me to join you in this way. And my apologies that I'm not able to be with you live in person, as it were. Just over five years ago, I was doing some research and I was thinking about the direction I wanted my postdoctoral research to take me. And I was keen to develop further my knowledge of indigenous land issues and land rights, as well as learn more about the cacao and chocolate supply chain fueled by my addiction to very dark chocolate. And whilst doing this research, I came across the chance to apply to be part of a group of academics from the UK, Mexico, Peru and Colombia to spend a week together. And my application was successful and the week that I spent in Risaralda in Colombia uh, with the hosts and with others was life changing for me. First hand, I had the opportunity to learn about a country and a region that I'd never been to before and to speak with people and visit places that both inspired me, but also challenged my way of thinking. I was developing my understanding and knowledge during that time about ecosystem services and the importance of preserving biodiversity. And it struck me that these issues cannot and should not be separated from human rights matters. And the more I read and write about human rights, promotion, protection, fulfillment, the more I think about natural resources and natural capital and the detrimental impact that the Anthropocene has had on those resources and capital and also on human capital as well. And I think that this interconnectedness is too often overlooked, not just by a neoliberal model of globalisation, formulated in pursuit of productivity, profit and economic growth aligned to shareholder maximisation, but also it's overlooked in international human rights discourse and the way that that rights framework has evolved. So that brings me to the chapter that I developed for the collection edited by Sara and Andres. My PhD research had focused on the Universal Periodic Review. And this is a United Nations international human rights monitoring mechanism and in this particular chapter I consider how we might conceptualize the UPR as it's known as creating a textual and political third space based on the work of Homi Baba. 
I suggest that in the UPR there is a third space that allows for marginalised identities and muted voices that are central to pioneering and championing social innovation and mobilisation to support social and natural capital, that they have the potential to be present and to be heard on the global stage via the UPR mechanism. And this is due to certain fundamental characteristics of the Universal Periodic Review. Firstly, UPR takes within its scope recommendations from other mechanisms in the international human rights regime, and that includes those made by non-state actors, such as special procedures and treaty bodies, as well as state actors themselves. Secondly, UPR is a state-to-state -state peer review mechanism. So states that are under review receive human rights recommendations directly from other states. Thirdly, all United Nations member states are scheduled for UPR, regardless of which human rights treaties have or have not been ratified. And this is part of the heart of the UPR's universality. And finally, the UPR's focus isn't limited to a particular right or a set of rights, unlike the work of human rights treaty bodies. And this means that states can make recommendations in relation to rights that may not be fully recognised in law and policy in a particular country. In terms of the process underpinning the UPR, each state is reviewed once in a five year cycle and during a three and a half hour working group session that takes place at the United Nations in Geneva, consideration is given of the state's own report and recommendations are received that may be informed by stakeholder submissions and a compilation by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which draws together recommendations made across the international human rights governance regime, so from treaty bodies, special procedures, etc. Okay, fantastic. So that was just an introduction of a chapter. Mm. Yep, yeah, so we just carry on with our presentation. So, a sec. Andre, would you like to, to respond to the okay. question? We, we go into the chat. next part of our book, which is the social innovation and natural capital. So we have invited both Jose and Carol to talk about the chapters uh, briefly. So if you please, Jose, I stop sharing on you. Share your. Yes, good morning, everybody. Just give me a minute so I can share my screen. If you could let me know if you are seeing. Yeah, perfect, man. Thanks. Now you're seeing full screen or you're seeing also my notes? <laughs> Also the note. Okay, so I'm going back to the previous one. <laughs> cool. so, yeah. so you won't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> so well, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jose Carlos Olivilla, and I'm presenting uh, one of the chapters of this nice book we just uh, heard the introduction by Andres. So I've divided the presentation into five parts as well as the chapter. So let's begin with the introduction. Uh, we have identified uh, like three common scenarios to engage uh, GHG emissions, greenhouse gases emissions, according uh, to mobility emissions. So the first one is vehicle downsizing and a clean energy matrix, which sometimes have no GHG emissions, no noise, and other positive effects. The second scenario is uh, to make of our public spaces sustainable spaces, and this can be by tactical urbanism in the short term, and in the long term with permanent uh, infrastructure. And the third scenario, and no less important, is to raise social awareness, which in ¿Por Lima... ¿Por qué Argentina... mencionan independencia? ¿Por qué mencionan independencia? I think there's an open microphone over there. So, um, and the third one, social awareness, which is... Um, not less important in Limi Callao because the behavior of our citizens has a strong impact on our GH emissions. And we talk about that in the present chapter. 
so this image is very well known. It talks about how can we fit 60 people, 60 persons in different transport modes. But we, what we can see in this image is that all of them are in the same space. So the figure is how can we make them to choose a sustainable way of mobility? This is another example where with tactical urbanism, what they have done is change the public space and not address the mobility choice. And the result is that people have changed their behaviors and more uh, pedestrians and activities have emerged. What is that? That is nudge. And a specific environment can uh, affect people's behaviors in a positive way, evidently. So the idea is to link different actors, public, private, and citizens, to encourage uh, sustainable behaviors through sustainable environments. And what about Lima's Callao environment? Well, the situation in Lima Callao is critical. We are we have uh, the poorest, one of the poorest quality air quality in the region, and uh, the numbers you see on the screen, uh, as I just said, is really critical. For example, uh, on the top ten causes of premature disease, we can find uh, three linked to. Uh, cardiovascular and respiratory system illness. So we practically brief cancer in Lima, and that is due to that due, that is due to diesel consumption, principally, half of the GHG emission comes from that, from transport emissions. And what about mobility in Lima? So the administration is problematic too. Uh, the administration of a mobility in Lima and Callao is held by three institutions principally. The Lima's Metropolitan Municipality, Callao's Provincial Municipality, and the Trans Urban Transport Authority for Lima and Callao. Below them, we find 50 local municipalities, and above them, we find ministry that also regulates transport and mobility. So this com administrative complexity has, as a result, the numbers we show uh, in this uh, image. And for example, the total length of the routes uh, equals three times the diameter of planet Earth. So we are facing a big problem in Lima and Kaya. This another figure also shows um, kind of a big picture of mobility in Lima. We have a very low motorization rate, 180 vehicles per thousand habitants, which is uh, less than half than other capital cities as Buenos Aires, for example. But we have an enviable a public transport share above 45 percent. Our problem is again is that we have a very poor quality of public transport. The average age of public transport vehicles is 22 years and uh, this low quality equals also a low passenger cost. This affects the behavior of citizens which is also uh, and the bad behavior is also enhanced because our public transport is ruled by free market rules. Uh, which means that the bus driver, when sees a person in the bus stop, in fact, he doesn't see a person, he sees a coin. So this enhances also a competition in public transport. So that also affects our citizen behavior. And then we come to some strategies that just nudge uh, some proposals and one that is also, that is already put in, in practice. Uh, so the first one is called Play City. These two maps uh, shows uh, virtual enhanced games that have been placed in two different cities uh, with successful results in gaming in the gaming topic. So uh, using these successful examples, we have mixed the Homo Ludens theory by Harold Wisinga, which uh, talks about the man that is ruled by games. We have mixed it with health and mobility issues addressed, addressed already by a lot of cities, which is we have make we need to do 30 minutes of activity physical activity each day. So some cities have put on place strategies that address this need in order for people to do bicycle, to walk. And these ideas, we want to mix them with the playful concept. There are other uh, examples and strategies that don't, are not necessarily mixed with mobility or the, uh, reducing GHG emissions. For example, the Volkswagen fund theory 
and the Space Invaders Street Art. Both of them have created different behaviors. They have created routes in order to follow these activities. So the idea is uh, to address mobility issues with these concepts. For example, it's important to know that when we are waiting for a bus, for example, uh, psychologically, times doubles. And when we are commuting, it triples. So what if we link these uh, playful activities to urban mobility? When, we when we're waiting for the bus, when we are commuting, what if we can find some playful uh, routes? No? That is the idea of the play city. For the next strategy, this is plan B that was proposed for a district in the city of Lima which aims to rediscover the city without haste. The idea is to use alternative routes for, uh, to pedag pedagogically uh, show people what is sustain a sustainable living. Uh, the problem that we have found is that it's not uh, easy and accessible to find information about sustainable ways of living. So the idea is to use mobility, to use alternative routes in order to link uh, sustainable offers, it can be food, it can be products, with the customers through alternative routes. So people can find another route in their way to work, in their way to their university. And in these uh, routes, they can find both virtually by an application, for example, and physically in the same route, these uh, products that are offering sustainable uh, way of living. So the idea of the route and the idea of the application is, uh, is used as an excuse to put out information on how to live a sustainable life. So you can find sustainable products, you are using a, a different route which is not contaminated. And the idea uh, for Lima Callao is also to put the priority on these routes to be safe because we have also a big rate of uh, automobilistic accidents. The third one, which I will not uh, talk about, is uh, the administration of San Isidro between 2015 and 2018, which between their objectives have addressed uh, the GHG emissions reduction. So mobility was a big part of it. Uh, also, the activation of the public space, which has uh, had a lot of nudge, not necessarily specifically, but with uh, very interesting results, which you can read about in the book, in the third chapter. So get, uh, get to read it, please. <laughs> and for the conclusions, very simple. Cities are the problem and cities are also the solution. Uh, we have had uh, symb symbiotic human settlements with nature, but it seems that we have forgotten how to do it. So the whole idea of this is to link private, public and citizenship into uh, sustainable behaviors by using also sustainable environments. And that is it. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot, Jose. Cheers for that. That's a very interesting chapter. And um, it's an, a, a very practical perspective of a, a very concerning problem in Latin America, which is mobility, right, and pollution. So the next um, author is Karen. Karen, if you wish, please. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, sorry, the inconvenience here of the setting, but uh, things change in the morning. So I want to thank uh, Andres and Sarah and the organizers for inviting me to share a little bit of what was written a couple of years ago. I have a few words to, to share. Do not have a presentation more of a reflection of how much the world has changed ever since we met in Pereira, Colombia, and where we are now. Um, and uh, I think we are uh, miles away from, from the world that we have in 2000, 2016 and 2017, right? 2023 now. We have endured a couple of crises. We have endured uh, the post-global post financial crisis of 2008, that's more or less the time when we met. We have endured um, a global pandemic, and now we're in the process of what uh, some scholars call the rise of a multipolar world. 
uh, in where uh, rising uh, powers like China and India are defining the future that is no longer Eurocentric, right? So I think this is very relevant in the context of what it was uh, analyzed back in 2000. And please correct me, Andres, if it was 2018 or, or 2019, I don't remember. It's just so much has happened ever since. But I think that the conversation over the influence or the potential uh, growth in terms of uh, alternative ideologies has become more and more important. And I think the book speaks to that. I think the book um, went ahead of time because um, the ideas of the so-called non-Western civilizations seem to be the ones that are going to uh, determine a new path. Um, that's that's my first argument, right? I think that the current context in where um, westernized, the West is falling down, although it's gonna take some time to do so, not only due to obvious the obvious conflict in Ukraine, but for internal dynamics, another financial crisis coming up, which is predicted for the end of the year. Um, and then these sort of like changing dynamics that are not fading away, or, or at least, you know, the changing geopolitical dynamics that are not uh, giving away um, to a new form of production and a new form of, of uh, conceiving um, the, the power dynamics opens the road for indigenous communities alternatives, uh, opens a road to post-colonialism, opens a road for considering what continents like Africa and Asia has to say to the future of the world. So I think in the case of our book, um, uh, the book that was edited by Andres and Sarah, I want to mention that uh, they they compile ideas that underline this important argument that is becoming relevant now in 2023. Um, the world is no longer Eurocentric. Uh, the world in the future will be probably um, defined by of, of rising powers, but that doesn't mean that it's a problem uh, necessarily, but it opens the road for us to, to look at this type of analysis and think about you know, solutions to the pressing issues that include global warming, include financial crisis, include social instability, political instability, and so on and so forth. So in my chapter, um, what I talked about is the case of a small community in the state of Michoacán, Mexico. Um, Mexico has a total of 62 ethnic communities. So uh, the, the way it's counted is uh, uh, ethnic groups that speak different languages. And one of them is a community of Tehran. Uh, this is obviously, as it is expected for the process of 500 years and, and the, late, the latest process of neoliberalism. Um, it is an impoverished community of mostly agricultural societies that you know were going through the motions of either migrating into the United States or staying home and and enduring life as it is in a rural area in, in the country of Mexico. So the interesting part about this community is that with the uprise of violence after the drug on wars um, that was launched by the Mexican government in 2006, with the aid of the United States government, um, communities like Charan were severely affected by the violence. But not only by the violence that bring the weapons and, and the confrontations between uh, the drug cartels and the military and the drug, uh, uh, the DEA from the United States, but also because um, the drug cartel or the drug organizations have moved into different business venue, including um, the, the exploitation of natural resources, which in this case was the forest, forest areas of the state of Michoacán. So uh, in, the, in the chapter, what is described is how the Cheran community organized based on principles of direct democracy to be able not to necessarily confront the drug cartels and the military, but to ensure that the forest will be protected. 
So the the chapter describes, you know, what process, uh, what what the people or the Cheran people have to do in order to organize as a community and confront the the powerful and dangerous uh, drug traffic organization and be successful at uh, protecting the forest. Um, you know, when when I was reading those those things in 2016, 2017. You know, it was sort of like, uh, oh, well, you know, uh, these communities are solving their issues. Those issues do not really reflect the state of the country. But as the time moved forward and we realized that, you know, countries like Mexico, El Salvador and so on and so forth, the issue of violence and the issue of um, environmental concerns has become has generalized. Right. Uh, it seems that in, in some states, you know, in some countries, the state is out of control and is, is a powerful drug trafficking organization that are taking over. So I think that um, the chapter, if you read the chapter now, you know, and, and look at the community of Cheran and what the community of Cheran did to be able to defend the forest, you know, the, the, the content has gained relevancy because the issues are getting out of control more and more and more out of the state, out of the institutions that we have. Are currently functioning. I mean, look at the United Nations right now. It's, it's an institution that is under severe constraint in a global governance institution that seems not to function anymore. So I think that my bottom line here is that, at least in the case of my chapter and, and Jose Carlos and, and, of course, the theoretical work of Andres, these theories and these ideas, these practices are gaining relevancy and can provide us information, useful information, to be able with cope, to cope, to be able to cope with situations that come, are going to come at the community level. So, in that sense, I think that the post-colonial vision and the knowledge of the indigenous communities all over the country can provide the alternatives to move forward. All right. So, those are my two cents. I thank you for your attention, and and I look forward for the questions and answer session. Fantastic. Thank you, Karen. So with this, we conclude our briefly explanation of our chapters. And you can actually see the whole overall perspective of the book. So we have 10 minutes to go. And I was wondering whether you guys want to ask any questions, people who participate today, and thankfully they connect to this little talk. Andres, we have some questions in the chat. Cool. The chat? Yes. Ah, okay. This is for Jose. Jose, how long does it take to change mobility behaviors? Well, that's a tricky question. Like um, the example we've had in San Isidro, for, which is a very nice example. Uh, I don't know if I said it like correctly, but it was a car dependent district. It is a car dependent district. And when that uh, administration began, and there was a total uh, was a total react, for example, to uh, bicycle mobility strategies. But at the end of that administration, about 2018, uh, bicycle share, like it, it started at one percent and finished at ten. So in four years, we changed uh, an important behavior in a car dependent district. That district also receives around 700,000 visitors a day because it's the central business district of the capital. And also that molar share changed, uh, the molar share of bicycle changed from 1% to 10% in four years. I think that that's really important, but changing behaviors depends on the strategy, depends on the on the context of, uh, of on how much people, it, it's different from a district to a school, for example. So it is difficult to say how much time in how much time you can change behaviors, but uh, it is total. Is it is doable? It is doable, and we must do it also because what I said about nudge, if our environment isn't uh, proper and sustainable, we won't behave sustainably. So it is important to do both of them. Fantastic, Jose. I'm afraid, Tom, we don't have any more questions. Though. I mean, there were direct questions to me which I answered, but they were in public. So. I think it was one question for you. For me? Uh, in okay, the chat. 
Can you check your chat? Uh, ah, yes. How Maurice, the role of Jose. indigenous organization? Yeah, actually, he responded. I thought he was direct. Uh, how do you see the role of indigenous organizations, such as COICA and other indigenous associates, to improve the BV dimensions? I mean, like, they're key. You know, this kind of um, connection in between civil society, you know, represented by organizations in practice, and the government, and, you know, of course, the economic uh, ecosystem is fundamental. So they are. They are because basically they are the ones who are implementing these kind of you know new practices, new approaches to at least challenge uh, development or, or you know the the Latin American approaches to development. That was the BV idea, you know, to find alternatives to development. Hence, um, organizations are are key. Are key. There are some who demonstrated actually throughout the book, and that's why we opened with this chapter, they illustrate like practices, especially from grassroots organizations, not necessarily mis organizations that are contributing to improve what was proposed back in the day for the practicality of BV. So it is, it is very, they are very important. We also want to invite you for joining us in, in the next TMS conference in from 11 to 14 September in Frankfurt for all of you that can join us. So we keep the conversations there. And also we will continue these book presentations uh, for, the, for our anniversary. And the next session will be in May. We will be presenting the UN Task Force Encyclopedia on Social and Solidarity Economy. So please stay tuned, stay connected, check our web page, and also you can write to us. I love the links. Thank you all. Okay, thank you. Bye.